With the release of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's time to stop and rank all nine Quentin Tarantino films from the worst to the best. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all nine Quentin Tarantino films. We're going to disagree because he's made a whole bunch of great films and a whole bunch of divisive films. Let's just have a nice, lively, yet respectful conversation. One final thing before we get started, people constantly ask me where I get my posters, my Funkos, and what equipment I use for my videos. There's a link down below in the description. It answers all of those questions. With that said, let's get started. In last place is Death Proof. Now this is kind of a fun little experiment that's kind of interesting that it exists, but it doesn't make for a particularly enjoyable film for me. There's about 45 minutes of plot, and then there's about an hour of Quentin Tarantino kind of doing his dialogue heavy thing. The problem here is that his dialogue heavy shtick requires requires that you care about the characters, and I did not care about any of these characters at all. And that's a little bit of the problem of combining Quentin Tarantino's dialogue heavy thing with the grindhouse genre. As soon as you have compelling characters, complex plot, character arcs, story development, all that kind of stuff, you're not really doing grindhouse cinema anymore. So combining these two things together, I just don't think on a conceptual level works. The movie takes 45 minutes to to get to the first kill in the scenes only about two minutes long. Then there's about 45 more minutes of dialogue until we get kind of the big finale. Granted, the finale to the film is very exciting. It's a very cool stunt heavy sequence that's like if the movie was more of that and not quite so much dialogue heavy, it would have been a much more enjoyable little exploitive film. But in an hour and 50 minutes with so little action inside of it, the movie just doesn't really work for me. One fun personal fact about this film, the scene at the gas station in the middle of the film is about one block away from the church I grew up attending. It's on the street called 620. It's like one mile away from the high school that I attended, five minutes away from the house that I grew up at. So watching this scene in the movie is kind of weird for me because I've driven down that road about 4,000 times. Coming in at number eight is The Hateful Eight. This is a film that I think if it had been about an hour and 40 minutes long, this could have been a very cool Western sort of whodunit. His film that would have been the most kind of like Reservoir Dogs in that it's kind of a contained environment, dialogue heavy, trying to figure out exactly what's going on and what happened. But unfortunately, it's a movie where he just kind of let his excesses run wild here. And you take a very simple plot line with very few locations and he runs it for a near three hours long and it just doesn't make any sense to be as long of a film as it is. He also shot it in 70 millimeter and then it takes place in this single cabin which once again just seems like such a strange decision. This film to me feels like a perfect example of how sometimes creative genius types need someone to kind of box them in a little bit when they're allowed to just do whatever they want to do that's not always the best thing. They need someone to explain to them, this is too much for how little plot that you have. Granted, to me, this movie got better as it goes along. The first half of the movie is just two or three times longer than it needs to be. And then the second half worked really pretty well for me and I liked how it wrapped up. But unfortunately, as the movie is, about twice as long as it needs to be, it's near the end of this list. Next up is Jackie Brown. This is an interesting film as it's a Quentin Tarantino film based off of an Elmore Leonard story. Of course, the performances here are all fantastic. There's tons of snappy dialogue throughout the entire film. It's a lot of fun to see Jackie Brown outthink everyone inside of the story, but I'm not sure if the way that Quentin Tarantino writes scenes is the best fit for the way that Elmore Leonard structures stories. Because you have a situation where the cleverness of Quentin Tarantino's dialogue starts to be a distraction from the cleverness of Elmer Leonard's plot line inside of the story. So for me, at times, it was a little bit confusing to figure out exactly what I was supposed to be focused on because Quentin Tarantino's having so much fun with his characters, but it's a plot heavy film with a lot of intricate pieces to it. So you're distracted by how much time is spent with characters just kind of sitting around talking about random kinds of things. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoy this film. I think it's good, 
but I just don't think that it's the best pairing of Quentin Tarantino with Elmore Leonard's story. Number six is Reservoir Dogs, the movie that started it all and it's kind of got all the staples of classic Tarantino. Of course, you've got the snappy dialogue with just characters sitting around the table talking about random things, but it's still so compelling. You have super cool characters that are interesting that have these intricate backstories and all these little nuanced details about their personalities. Inside of it, it's also kind of a blend of genres of sorts of the way that it works. It has all sorts of retro nostalgia, or it has a retro nostalgia soundtrack sprinkled throughout it. On a story level, it's kind of a who done it in that you're trying to figure out who exactly the mole is, what exactly happened. It's a movie all about a heist and you barely just see little pieces of the aftermath of the heist and then you see kind of this they gather together afterwards all of this just making for a very strange interesting way to tell a story in speaking of how the story's told it's a very play like film in that there's very few locations the scenes are very long dialogue heavy and there's only kind of a couple sequences that get kind of cinematic for example Mr. Orange's backstory of how he became the undercover cop does some cinematic tricks inside of it, but besides that, it plays out in a manner that could be a stage production. All in all, this is a great little start to a career, an example of just how talented he was right out of the gate. Number five is Kill Bill, Quentin Tarantino's take on martial arts films, Asian cinema, the contemporary Western, and revenge cinema. It's a mix that only Quentin Tarantino could cook up because it feels like so many other things while feeling like a film that only only Quentin Tarantino could make. The action is fantastic. It's a wonderful homage to so many different things. As you just watch through it, from the score to the way scenes are choreographed, it just touches on so many different genres that I absolutely love. So many of the moments, the twists and the turns pay off. While it's a very simple, straightforward story, the moments hit the way that they're supposed to. I'm not quite sure that it needed to be a four hour long story and I think it might have worked a little bit different or a little bit better had it been in a different order, but still, this is a very cool film, and like many of his films, this one feels like it's structured, not like a play like I mentioned with Reservoir Dogs, but kind of like a book cut into chapters, and you kind of tell this tale, and then you cut to the next piece, which is such an interesting way to tell a story like this. Now, had I divided Kill Bill into two parts, volume two would have been at number seven on this list. I just felt like that one had a little bit more fat on it and I think that they needed to do a little bit more with the actual fight between the bride and Bill and then we would have had a Reservoir Dogs. Then volume one would have been at this spot right here because I just think it is a great little martial arts revenge film. Coming in at number four is Django Unchained. If Kill Bill was Quentin Tarantino's take on the martial arts film with just a dabbling into the modern western, this is Tarantino going full revenge western and I think he might have crafted the coolest Western of all time. Not necessarily the best, but the coolest Western of all time. Inside of it, you of course have fantastic gunplay, and when it happens, it is so over the top, ultra violent, that it is awesome to look at. But beyond that, the scenes build tension, conflict. Some of them are horrifying, like the Mandingo sequence. Throughout the whole th time, you're building to this fact that you just hate the villains inside of this film. Obviously, they're slave owners, but they're just so dehumanizing in their treatment of the slaves that you can't wait to see the revenge taken out upon them. And a big part of the reason that this film works is because of the performances. Christoph Waltz, in that one-two punch of Inglorious Bastards in this film, just crafted these two characters uh, in these films that are so mesmerizing in the little details of his performance that make you so fascinated by these characters as you go through it. And even as this one is you get to kind of the big payoff with his character that you just love these final moments with him and just refusing to shake a hand and what that leads to. Add to that Leonardo DiCaprio playing this absolutely despicable character that you absolutely want to be seen killed. I think that Samuel L. Jackson's performance in this film is the best I've ever seen him. And I think he's fantastic in everything that he does, but a lot of times he's just doing kind of his Samuel L. Jackson, kind of very loud, mouthy, charismatic performance. Here, he is acting. Like, you can forget 
how good of an actor he is because we see him as the persona so often, but the performance here is just unbelievable. And once again, another character that is absolutely despicable. And then Jamie Foxx in the lead is just so cool as Django himself. Now this is a film that I think that could have trimmed about 10 minutes out of the middle act. As soon after the Mandingo sequence from there until when Django actually kind of meets up with his wife, seemed like it dragged for just a little bit right there. Not a lot, just a little bit. Tighten that up just a bit and this might have been top two for me. Real quick before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. Also, after this video, check out this playlist up above. I've got some of my other rankings of director's filmographies up there. I got Nolan, M. Night Shyamalan, I got John Favreau in there. If you've enjoyed this video, there's probably something else in there that you'll enjoy. In third place is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is Tarantino at his most sentimental, basically making a love letter to 1960s Hollywood. The film exists basically for us to see kind of his fantasy version of the 1960s Hollywood, what a day in the life was like, what he kind of wished would have happened, and kind of giving his alternate take on history in a very Quentin Tarantino fashion. A big part of the reason the way the movie works is because there's just such a great bromance between Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, and they work so well together, and you enjoy their interactions so much that even though the movie can kind of meander quite a bit in the middle act of the film, I was kind of captivated by the entire thing, especially because the Leonardo DiCaprio's character is so self-involved, self-doubting, but in a way that doesn't come off fully selfish, so you still kind of like him, and then you have Brad Pitt's character who is so self-aware of how silly Hollywood is, so he kind of gives the audience's perspective on all the kind of shenanigans going on, and it just makes for a great little comedy between the two of them, and for me, this is a movie that while it's not story-based, I thought that it was kind of his most well-crafted story in certain ways in that throughout the whole film, they kind of put all these little pieces in place that build up to the finale. You don't know where they're kind of all headed. You don't know how they all tie together, but you get to that final 20 minutes and so many little things earlier in the film pay off in the finale, and I absolutely loved where this movie went. I understand a lot of people seem to be bored by it, they found the end disrespectful, and then, I, you know, people like me, I just kind of really enjoyed what he was trying to do and appreciated his love letter to Hollywood. Our runner-up is Inglorious Bastards, Quentin Tarantino's take on World War II, and in a lot of ways it functions a lot more as a spy film than as an all-out war film, while giving us little tastes of each of these genres. All the while, it's told kind of in a very chapter-esque format where the scenes are like 20 minutes long and each kind of sequence in the film is about 40 minutes long where they're very dialogue heavy and you just kind of sit in these environments as he slowly winds up the tension. The movie kicks off with this fantastic sequence with Christoph Waltz showing up and drinking milk with this guy and just having this conversation. And as it's going on, you just feel the tension building and building and building. And that's the way this whole movie kind of works. You have the sequence with Michael Fassbender inside of a bar that as these people are just talking, you're captivated by it, you're mesmerized by it, all the while knowing this is going somewhere really bad, really strong soon. This is kind of Quentin Tarantino in some of his most masterful direction because of his ability to build that conflict and tension inside of each of these sequences without needing to do all the big flashy Hollywood stuff. It's all about Tarantino characters, Tarantino dialogue, and the little details and everything that make you go, oh, this is going really bad. All building to a big slam bang, ultra violent Tarantino alternative history finale that once again is fantastic and then the little epilogue on the end with some nice little codas to the film and ending on just the right note. But coming in at number one is Pulp Fiction. This is a film that takes all of the rules about storytelling and screenwriting. All the stuff that I normally use to evaluate a film 
throws it out and just does its own thing and somehow it works. Something about what Tarantino is able to do with this film is create these little vignettes, these little windows into a day in the life of these characters. There's no single strong story arc throughout the entire film. It's not about these big character arcs. It's all about the little interactions, these little sequences, the stories, not the story. And somehow he ties it together in a way out of order that absolutely works and keeps you locked into your seat with your eyes on the screen from beginning to end. He has this ability to contrast totally normal conversations about fast food with ultra violence in a way that really it seems like only he's able to pull off without feeling totally inconsistent. It's a movie that manages to tell these very simple kind of stories inside of the story without needing a big bad, a single conflict to overcome, but in each sequence, there is a conflict inside of it that's very intriguing, even if it's just kind of the ticking clock waiting for the Bonnie situation, for Bonnie to come home and ruin a guy's marriage. And like so many people my age, this was a very important film for me because it was one of those first smaller indie films that I saw that made me go, oh, there's other stuff out there besides big blockbusters. There's all sorts of creative ways that people can tell stories that can be familiar, but totally different and new at the same time. This was a movie that made me love movies, which is a lot of the reasons that so many people love this film is because it was so important to them. It's that important to me as well. So for me, because of how great it is, because of how important it is to me, it comes in at number one. Remember to check out that playlist right over there with some of my rankings of some other directors' filmographies. I got Nolan, Favreau, M. Night in there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.